Ah, the big screen. Some popcorn, a good movie, and if all goes well, some toys will eventually show up in the toy store. True to years, it hasn't been easy to create toy lines solely based on a movie unless you got the Star Wars name on it. Often, movies would license their character to toy companies, and in many occasions, the toys got canceled before anyone could buy them. In this week's Ed's Retro Geek Out, we take a look at a couple of unproduced movie toys. So subscribe to the channel and strap in for some toy history. It seems like every 80s toy history is somewhat connected to the Kenner Star Wars toy line. And it is, after George Lucas shopped around the license for his cowboy space movie in the 70s, nobody seemed to jump on it apart from Kenner. And all the other toy companies tried to rival the success that were the Kenner Tree quarter inch toys. But then again, the toy companies tried to catch up by creating toys that we still love to talk about to this day. Spawning the greats like Masters of the Universe or G.I. Joe. And this week we're talking about movie inspired toys and let's face it in the 80s we had some of the best action adventure flicks for kids one of those would combine the space theme with another popular pastime video games the last starfighter is a space opera film telling the story of a teenager being recruited by an alien defense force to fight in an interstellar war next to disney's tron it's one of cinema's earliest instances where they heavily relied on cgi or computer generated imagery to depict the starships and battle scenes, but also using CGI to represent all real-life objects. And among those real-life objects, some of them were never produced into a real-life toy. Announced in the 1984 Galoob Toy Fair catalog, the last Starfighter toys would have graced the toy store shelves that year. The toy line, 12 figures strong, would have featured fully articulated 4-inch characters, so you could have the good battling the evil from Rylos to Kodan. The figures would have been released in two packs. Featured on the promo pictures are the prototypes not showing any weapons, but a nice variety of space monsters and humans that could have easily slipped in with your Star Wars collection. And a toy of the Gunstar spaceship would have been greatly appreciated as well. With the Star Wars trilogy coming to an end a year earlier, Galoob was hoping that The Last Starfighter could bring in a similar success as the Kenner toys. And even though the movie did okay at the box office, the response of retail toy buyers didn't do well enough for Galoob to pull the trigger on releasing these. The toy market is based on supply and demand, and if the demand just isn't there, you can't supply it, can you? Then again, it was a simpler time before Skynet took over with bot-driven pre-order mania and scalpers around every freaking corner. Yet we did get a Marvel Comics series, video games, and eventually Good Guys Never Win Toy Co. released the figures based on the prototypes as collectible exclusives. But what about movies that became blockbusters instead of cult movies like E.T. the Extraterrestrial? Surely you're gonna squeeze that little alien life form into every piece of merchandise you have available, right? LJN got the license to produce toys based on the little friendly xenomorph and it resulted into a series of mostly non-articulated E.T.'s in various outfits or holding different items from the movie and obviously all the other usual merchandising. They actually had a lot more planned. In 1983, they would have even released a spaceship playset, finally revealing the inside of E.T.'s space vessel. It would have come with a unique E.T. figure and came with lots of features including secret storage compartments, working elevator, trigger activated landing pods, and a handle so it could be easily carried. The layout would have featured multiple playing areas like the control room, the botanical laboratory, navigation center and the engine room. Yet we could only dream that if a sequel was created some of the scenes might have taken place within this spaceship. But apart from a very grainy picture in a toy catalog, LJN unfortunately had to have this playset phone home. Even Matchbox was trying to cash in on a small kid friendly movie star. Their eyes fell on short circuit. The little robot proved to be the perfect RC car match. The star of the hit movie Short Circuit and soon to be released sequel Number 5 Robot is now a 14 and a half inch radio controlled robot. Not only can it move forward, left, right and stop, you can also transmit your voice to make him speak in his own unique voice. His eyes would light up, he came with articulated arms, head and even had spring loaded 
loaded hands that enabled him to carry things around for you as your own personal robot. Like the one in Rocky IV, Polly's robot girlfriend. Well in the end Short Circuit 2 didn't perform too well at the box office and other toy robot helper servants took over the shelf space at the local toy stores near you. I think in this day and age we can all use a little bit of help from our little robot buddy Emilio to get those NECA pre-orders. And now, on with the show. Dark Crystal was another 80s masterpiece, co-created by Jim Henson, who most people know from the Muppets. There was a toy line planned, six figures would have each come with a piece of the Dark Crystal, creating one of the first build a crystal concepts or maybe better known as the bath, build a figure. Collect all six figures and create your own dark crystal. There were also three slightly bigger deluxe beasts that would have come out in a window box package. All these can be seen in the 1983 Aviva catalog, and Aviva was a division of Hasbro at the time. So here's why we never saw them on the shelves. The creation of the toy line started a little late, and that in combination with the movie's box office performance, that also raised questions with parents about the somewhat Somewhat darker tone of the movie. After all, it wasn't Kermit and Miss Piggy type comedy we knew from the Muppet creator. Now all of these things cost the toy line to get cancelled before it was even produced. But luckily in the present we can get multiple lines based on the movie and the new series like the reaction line, McFarlane toys and obviously Funko Pops. They're everywhere. Everywhere. Now it seems like where they went too careful in the 80s and 90s just had an anything ghost policy. By now, toy companies seem to have caught on onto the just-in-time principle of kid bashing and reusing old molds to create the toy lines for these movies. Often, a movie with the appeal for a younger audience would get a cartoon with a toy line to expand the movie's universe to the small screen and provide a longer term for the merchandise to sell. The 90s was also a strange place where wannabe blockbuster movies set a status by prepping their merchandising with a video game, which most of the time was already an existing game with a sprite swap and a toy line. <laughs> Waterworld. And even with the movie flopping, there would be tons of the toy line out on shelves or stocked up somewhere until they would get discovered again. But what about before Star Wars? In the 70s, Mego Corporation had some experiences creating toys for movies like The Planet of the Apes. But they were also tight with comic book superheroes and even new Clark Kent. So, Superman the movie was no different. They would make toys based on the movie, though apart from Superman, they did head back to the comics for a more toyetic character design to include some characters for the 12 inch movie line. Otherwise it would have just had more celebrity dolls, which was also a Mego thing back in the day. Added was Jor-El, General Zod, and Lex Luthor based on the comics, as well as adding them to the smaller pocket superheroes line. For both, a playset was also designed but never produced. The Fortress of Solitude would have been a large trifold playset with backgrounds inspired by the movie. The smaller line would have possibly reused other molds like they had done for the figures. In the end, the Superman toys didn't increase sales for Mego, so they pulled the plug on the line. And it wasn't due to kryptonite, but due to Star Wars taking a big chunk of the toy market share. I'm stuck in a vicious circle with the Star Wars stuff, ain't I? Even James Bond, one of the longest successful franchises, took 007 into space in 79, because it was all the rage. Moonraker the 11th movie in the series starring Roger Moore has space espionage and a cool villain henchman we knew from the previous movies called Jaws. So yeah, it was toyetic. They went with the 12 inch toy line they were known for featuring James Bond, the villain Drax, Dr. Holly Goodhead, which they just called Holly for obvious reasons. Jaws had some delay in the production process, which meant that he would remain to be a European elusive exclusive. But once again, Mego had bigger plants, or should I say smaller. One Mego catalog showcased a glimpse of what could have been a three-quarter inch toy line, with vehicles including the Moonraker jet boat, international espionage takes to the seas in a super spy boat that actually shoots true to water. It's jet stream propelled for high speed escapes and chases, and comes with two articulated figures which we can't see on the picture. The Moonraker space shuttle was a slick streamlined space vehicle with retractable landing 
mounting gear. The cockpit can open up, and it also comes with two figures. And then there's the Moonraker helicopter, a versatile action craft that really takes off. Just strap in your spy and pull the ripcord. So on the helicopter, there's a little glimpse of what the figures could have looked like. And that's it for this episode, but no worries because Toy History will return in an all new episode next week. Please leave a like, leave a comment on which movie you wish had a toy line. Be sure to subscribe to the channel if you want to do more, you can always check out my Patreon page. Thank you so much for watching and I hope to see you in the next video. Bye!